John Stuart Mill says in his Principles of Political Economy, it is questionable if all the mechanical inventions yet made have lightened the day's toil of any human being. That is, however, by no means the aim of the capitalist application of machinery. In this chapter, Marx discusses the role of machinery and its introduction and function within the capitalist production process. This is a very important period within capitalism for Marx for two reasons. It's the moment when capital finally frees itself from the limitations of the laborer's human body and skill. And it's also the moment when the laborer becomes truly subservient to capital. Here we have, in the place of the isolated machine, a mechanical monster whose body fills whole factories and whose demon power, at first veiled under the slow and measured motions of his giant limbs, at length breaks out into fast and furious whirl of his countless working organs. What is a machine? For Marx, a machine is essentially a complex tool, or more precisely, a conversion of the tools into a mechanized form, powered by a natural force. In this sense, it's not labor, but the instruments of labor themselves that serve as the starting point of machinery. Marx argues that the function of a machine is to replicate the processes the laborer previously did with their tools. The difference, however, is that with tools, the worker's body and skill dictated the labor process, how the tool worked, what to do with it, the speed of labor, etc. With machinery, however, the roles become reversed. The laborer, in their now supporting role of the labor process, becomes controlled by the tool. How it works, what to use it for, its speed, etc., all become forced upon the worker. At the start of this chapter, Marx quotes the classical political economist John Stuart Mill, who questioned whether machines had actually helped create less work for humans or not. Marx's reply is no because under a capitalist mode of production, machines are not used for the purpose of creating less work, but more. That is to lower the amount of time required it takes to do a specific task, but only so more of those tasks can be completed within a given time. Their function is to increase productivity within labor, to reduce necessary labor time while increasing surplus labor time. Here, Marx also details how Machines also utilize the division of labor in similar methods discussed in the previous chapter, performing more and more specialized roles that become linked to other machines to create vast complex systems of automated machinery, filling the whole factory that can produce the entire commodity. He also mentions that the development of machinery in certain sections of production lead to the development of machinery in others and this increasing use of machinery led to the large-scale industry of machines producing machines. It must be observed that machinery, while always entering as a whole into the labor process, enters into the value-begetting process only by bits. It never adds more value than it loses. Machinery is just sophisticated constant capital, and as Marx discussed in chapter 8, constant capital does not create any new value. It only transfers its existing value into the final product. And just as any other constant capital, its value is determined by the labor that went into producing the machinery in the first place. Because their value is transferred, introducing a new machine increases the value of the total overall product. For example, if we imagined a football making machine that has the value of 1,000 pound, and imagine the entirety of all the footballs made after the machine finally breaks, then their collective value as footballs has also increased by 1,000 pounds. However, because of the huge increase in productivity caused by the machine, the 1,000 pound value of the machine is actually transferred and spread across a much larger quantity of individual footballs than previous. So the relative value of footballs increases, but the absolute value of the individual football 
decreases. To add to this, as the productivity within the manufacturing of machines themselves increases, they also become cheaper. So over time, the value of introducing existing machines also decreases, meaning less value is transferred into the final product. Marx argues that under a capitalist mode of production, it is only beneficial for capitalists to purchase machinery when the costs of that machinery is less than the cost of the wages of the labour it replaces, or when it's cheaper to buy than pay the workers. However, as the machine doesn't actually create value, unlike labour power, this further decreases the value of the final product. For example, a machine of £500 replacing a worker whose wages were £500 doesn't take into account the extra value that that worker would have added to the final product. So the labour represented in the machine is less than the labour it replaces. To add to this, and something that is very relevant in today's world, as the value of labour power can vary greatly from country to country, the production of a machine in some countries embodies far less value than that in another. When these are sold to a different country and replace workers there, there is a significant decrease of the value of the final product. Marx also highlights a few interesting points here. Firstly, that if wages are lower, there is less incentive for capitalists to actually use machinery. It is simply cheaper for them to continue to use labourers. Secondly, if the use of machinery drives down the value of labour power low enough, it prevents further development or usage of machinery, as it now becomes more beneficial for the capitalists to simply use this now new, cheaper labour power instead. Capitalism, therefore, does not use machinery to lighten the amount of work performed by humans for the production of use values, but instead to increase productivity in its never-ending thirst to obtain surplus value. Machinery under a capitalist mode of production, therefore, becomes limited in its applications. Science, technology and innovation instead become incorporated solely into capitalism and are developed for its own desires rather than used for the broad scope of desires and needs of humans. Capital is by nature a leveller, since it exacts in every sphere of production equality in the conditions of the exploitation of labour. Firstly, Marx argues that with the introduction of machinery, the skills and strength that were required for certain jobs became removed as they were instead replicated by machinery. This allowed capital to now incorporate other workers into it, namely women and children, leading to the whole family now being forced to sell their labour. Parents would have less time to cook and look after their children and family, and the children had less time to learn domestic skills. So because people had less time and knowledge on how to cook, mend their own clothes and produce more things for their own needs, they instead purchased more commodities as substitutes. Infant mortality rates increased, and even sometimes infants were intentionally poisoned or starved to death simply because their parents couldn't afford to support them. Children were often sold into the terrible working conditions that Marx discussed in chapter 10 by their parents. Marx also discusses how this intellectual degeneration of children led to the creation of mandatory school, with the purpose of teaching children how to labour, though they were often overcrowded with very few teachers and very few materials. Secondly, machines decay and must be maintained whether they are used or not. Also, the advantage that a capitalist has over other capitalists by purchasing a new machine is a short amount of time until the other capitalists do the same and the increasing productivity of producing the machines themselves lowers the value of machines. All these reasons means it's more beneficial for the capitalists to use their machine as often and as fast as possible to stay ahead of their competition. This created new motives for the length of the working day to be extended with the night work and the development of the relay system 
discussed earlier in the book. Thirdly, Marx highlights how the widespread use of machinery and its taking over the jobs of workers produces a surplus population of people made redundant. This unemployed surplus population then are both subject to working for any job that capital desires and also fighting between themselves for jobs on the labour market, further reducing the value of labour power. This is a topic Marx will return to, however, in a later chapter. At the start of this series, I said that Marx, in his analysis of capitalism, is going to assume that all labour is performed at a constant intensity. Here, however, he takes a small break from that assumption to highlight an interesting point. In real life, humans get tired, hungry and worn out throughout the day, and their ability to perform labour over a period of time decreases. For example, somebody would not be as intense at making footballs after working for 10 hours straight as the person who has only worked for two hours. The introduction of machinery, however, in its simplifying of the worker's specific tasks within production, allows the worker to be more intense for much longer periods of time. 